And my uncle and my father and my grandfather, they were all professors at the university, so I, I had lectures from each one of them. And, and uh, so it was very good. It was, it was uh, uh, almost a family business, if you like, or a particular way of looking at things. But uh, they're also uh, uh, interested in language and math and so on. So they, they, were, they, were, good, they were good people. And so when I came to the States, I came to the States in, in uh, 59 uh, to the Mass General to do a neurosurgery and uh, decided to come to the MBL, to see the MBL. And uh, I, of course, knew about Squid and the giant axon and Hodgkin Huxley had won a Nobel Prize in 52 and, 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 and uh, it was... Uh, uh, I would. I always, by the way, liked the nervous system. So even even when I was in medical school, I went to to Zurich to Switzerland to work with someone called Hess, who was a well-known Nobel Prize guy. So, and so there was the uh, the interest always uh, that I should understand as much as I can about brain function. And it was very clear that you couldn't just go into the brain function, but you had to understand the components. And uh, so uh, coming to the States was uh, actually lovely, and then I went to the Mass General, but it's not, didn't like very much the surgery aspect of it. It was a bit primitive, really. And uh, so I decided to, um, to go to Minneapolis. Uh, there was a very well-known person at the time who was doing electrophysiology in the spinal cord in, in modern neuron. And so uh, I had a postdoc with him, uh, with Terswolo, yeah, this was uh, in, <clears throat> and um, decided to come to the MBL with him to study the giant axon of uh, uh, one of the invertebrates. In fact, the lobster giant axon. And so I fell in love with the place. And so uh, from, from the first visit in 59 and then the first lab 62, uh, I've been here every, every summer. So I skipped a couple of years when I was going to Australia with Eccles, but uh, otherwise, you know, MDL has been all my summers. Right, I came to visit and I wanted to see, I knew about the squid, uh, giant axon, and I met uh, the people uh, uh, who were doing uh, giant axon at the time. Uh, and um, so I thought it was absolutely wonderful. So uh, when we decided to come in 62 uh, with Tersuolo, we came uh, to Grunfist lab. And this was a very interesting year because Hodgkin and Huxley were here, and there's a whole lot of people, and it was delightful. I mean, it was uh, uh, we all had lunch in the mess hall, and uh, there was only this this uh, um, this building, uh, the building and the main building, yeah. and so you know there were maybe forty people, and we all discussed, and we all it was almost a family affair. And the director was one person, and there were two people more, and that was it, you know. Uh, so, very interesting, very lovely. <laughs> I did a PhD with Eccles, right, on the cerebellum. And, uh, uh, you know, it was very intriguing. It was the first time that any part of the brain was completely understood as far as the connectivity and, and the physiology. So it was a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous work that we did and, and very, well, very well known. And, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the stories are, are wonderful because you know, we, it took us two years and there were three of us working, we worked there all the time. And so we understood circuits and so on and so forth. 
and the question is, okay, how does this, how this cerebellum relate to the rest of the brain? We will do in another six months or a year. Of course, <laughs> it's been now whatever, almost 50 years, and we still don't know how, because uh, it doesn't operate by itself. And so it is the relation between the things that we know, the cerebellum and the rest, that has made the whole thing so, so beautiful and so complicated. Well, um, there, there are two or three points that are very important. First of all, it is a very large synapse. So it is possible to visualize it with light microscopy. It is large enough that you can access it easily. You can put up to five electrodes into the, into the synapse. You can put three electrodes in the presynaptic and two electrodes in the post. So you can voltage clamp both of them anyhow. So it, it was from, from the fact it was a giant synapse. It, it allowed things that you couldn't dream of doing anywhere else. Uh, and, and so uh, the next question uh, was, can we separate the ability of the nerve to generate an action potential from the secretory event that is activated by the action potential? And so, for the first time, we got rid of this sodium and potassium current, that there are no spikes, and they polarize artificially by injecting current, basically an artificial action potential, and it released. So they say, okay, we have it by the cookies, you know, <laughs> right? You know, we, can, we don't need an action potential anymore. We can do different waveforms, and we can do square pulses, and we can try to find out what the steps are. Uh, and so we did direct stimulation and found that you can get released without action potentials. And there was a you know, paper in, uh, in, in Nature, it was uh, uh, you know, very intriguing because we separated for the first time the action potential for synaptic transmission. And then uh, in, after doing that, we went to Australia and came back, and we uh, continued doing uh, research, doing then uh, did voltage clamp, and found that transmission uh, required calcium to come in. It was suspected, but nobody had really seen calcium currents before. So then we found that there's, and then we voltage clamped the calcium current, and we found you know, where it comes, what is the shape, what are the kinetics of the channels, and so on. And so the story has been to, to do the biophysics of synaptic transmission, which turned out to be very similar to the, of the vertebrate world. So it became a serious, a serious effort and a well-known uh, set of studies. And, and so um, the issue is, okay, we, we must therefore understand uh, the mechanism in the synapse simply because it is so accessible. And with the electron microscopy and then injected anti antibodies and injected all kinds of drugs. And, and, and uh, over the years, we've been amassing more and more information, you know, facilitation, inhibition, uh, uh, the, uh, the importance of mitochondria, uh, the importance of, uh, of uh, ionic conductances of different types, what happens if you change uh, calcium for another divalent cation, and so on. And so the biophysics of the synaptic transmission uh, that we know of seriously is mostly what is done in the synapse of the squid. Then there, there were other synapses that came later, also you can do similar things, but the results were very much the same that uh, we have found, I mean, or we, because there are several people working the synapse that we all have found. And so that's been the, uh, the story from a voice whole point of view. Basically, we've done a mostly squid synaptic transmission. So the story has been to, to do the biophysics of synaptic transmission which turned out to be very similar to that of the vertebrate 
world. So it became a serious, a serious effort and a well-known uh, set of studies. And, and so um, the issue is, okay, we, we must therefore understand uh, the mechanism in the synapse simply because it is so accessible. And with the electron microscopy and then injected anti antibodies and injected all kinds of drugs and 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 uh, over the years we've been amassing more and more information, you know, facilitation, inhibition, uh, uh, the uh, the importance of mitochondria, uh, the importance of uh, of uh, ionic conductances of different types, what happens if you change uh, calcium for another divalent cation and so on. And so the biophysics of the synaptic transmission uh, that we know of seriously is mostly what is done in the synapse of the square. And, the and so that's been the, uh, the story from a voice whole point of view. Basically, we've done a mostly squid synaptic transmission. And, and then we began to realize that there was a basic mistake in the understanding of the nervous system. And the basic mistake was uh, Foster and had as its origin the view that the uh, nervous system is really a, a, bet, a set of reflexes. The information comes from the outside and then you see, and uh, information comes from, uh, from vision and audition and sensory. And somehow the, the nervous system uh, is there to organize this incoming information and then produce electricity. You know, basically, the nervous system can only activate muscles or glands. So I tell my students, either you move or you drool. That's all you can do. That's true. OK. So now the question is, maybe this is wrong. And then you begin to think, it has to be wrong. It has to be wrong because, for instance, um, when I fall asleep, I dream. And I dream in full color with background music and the whole thing. So, but there is no input. So, where is this activity coming from? And then very slowly, the ideas came to, well, uh, actually, uh, most of the brain operates on its own in the absence of external stimuli. So, okay, uh, so major problem, you know, intrinsic properties, intrinsic electrical properties of the brain are far more interesting and more important than the physiology you do by stimulating sensory inputs or by recording motor outputs. And so the whole, uh, the whole view of, of intrinsic properties uh, came up. And it came out of the inferior olive and the thalamus. And then, of course, begin to realize, yes, I dream, that's what I was saying. Uh, where, where is this? How is dreaming different? Is the visual system different when you dream than when you look with your eyes? And so the question is, OK, can we have an idea of what's happening? And, uh, and so we decided to work on animals and in hum uh, humans, and I, uh, I was I became very excited about magnetoencephalography very early on. So we have, I got somebody who gave me one. And, uh, and uh, we began to understand, we began to do the kind of things that you can do with electrodes in animals uh, doing magnetic recording with humans. You could simulate and see a response and uh, you know, you could uh, do analysis to see how the information comes in and how it bounces and so on and and uh, uh, and so the 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 connection between the the single cell physiology in squid with the single cell physiology in slices with the single cell physiology in isolated brain which is the only something else we decided to do was to see if we could remove a brain and keep it alive and you can and so um the uh, the movement uh, of the of the uh, ideology or the conceptology was uh, from a single cell outwards into groups of cells, and then suddenly this idea that you know, the nervous system has a point of view, 
and the information that comes in must be put into the context of what's going on. And so, uh, the the type of thought that came up became very strange because I think, well, you know, um, <laughs> it's strange. You say, well, you know, perception is a dreamlike event. It happens two ways. Either it's modulated from the external world, or it's generated when you, there is an external world in your dreams, or in your thoughts. And, and so it was, it was one of these things that still most people are, don't, are not very happy about. But that's how it is. <laughs> it, it is, it is really very, very intriguing because uh, it has, it was a total misunderstanding of the nature of what we are first and of the, of the nature of how, how the brain works. Because, you know, it was basically things coming from the outside and that cannot be. Um, you know, most of us think and close, I close my eyes, I want to think clearly and I can see things rotating and so on. And, and, uh, and the language, I mean, oh, it, it was that event from, from a, a externally modulated brain to an internally organized brain that considers what is outside. Now, um, you know, actually, it's, 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 it's been taking, it's taken a long time. Uh, uh, finally, not, very, not many years ago, when, 10 years ago, we began to, to uh, generate experiments where um, we can um, image very carefully in, uh, you know, using minor encephalography, uh, image what happens when you give a stimulus uh, and, uh, uh, say, a visual stimulus. And visual stimulus can be very short or very long, so you can, you can increase the duration of the stimulus. If you give a very short stimulus, uh, which you can, you can see in your computer and so on, uh, the person that is looking at this particular screen doesn't, doesn't see anything. It's too short. Right? But if you look with MEG, you find that the retina saw it and the visual cortex saw it, but you didn't. So the first thing was you don't see with your visual cortex. Oh my God, <laughs> you don't. So if you increase a little bit further the stimulus duration, then you find that uh, the stimulus goes into the thalamus, to the cortex, returns to the thalamus, and goes to the association cortex. And then uh, when you do that, you see it, you look at the person, the person will tell you, I saw something, but I didn't know what it was. So you increase a little bit the duration, and you find that, again, the system goes to the visual cortex, to the thalamus, association cortex, back to the thalamus, temporal cortex back to the thalamus, and then you say, it's an A. And so it, it, it was completely, it's totally different to what we, th we thought the system was. I mean, it's, it's basically uh, taken apart by the different systems and put together and, and in, in different ways, de and depending on the duration of the stimulus. And the next question was, uh, what happens when you dream? Which is one of the things that I really desperately needed to know. I dream in full color with background music. I mean, it's fantastic, right? And so the question is, where is it generated? And it was, it was we just you know, we did some studies with MEG, and we found that the, cort the visual cortex is not involved. No, it's, it's mostly brain, upper brain stem thalamus and association cortices. And, and, uh, and so, we had the first images of what a dream looks like in, in brain space. And it was, you know, it was absolutely terrific. And so this is, this is in, in few words, the kind of stuff that, that uh, I've been interested in my life. You know, it's the same. It's quit synapse and, you know, you know, the brain and the brain of people and the brain of mice and so on. It's, uh, <laughs>